Sorry, Will, can you um, allow me to share my screen? Absolutely. Hello, everyone who's joining us. We'll just be a couple of minutes as we uh, let people in and and um, sort out of things technically. I'm just going to give people another minute. I'm just getting so. in. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a big meeting, so there's quite a bit going on. Yeah. So I think I'm going to make a start now because we're a couple of minutes past seven, but obviously um, people can keep joining. Um, welcome to this um, slightly different Sussex Universe event tonight. So those of you who are familiar with um, with the with the system, we'd normally have a pre-recorded talk followed by a live Q&A via Zoom, but obviously today we're doing things slightly differently. So today is really going to be focusing more on the, the panel Q&A. So we've got a a handful of astronomers from across the country who are going to hopefully answer some of your pressing questions about the future of observational astronomy. Um, I just want to advertise for the people who haven't joined a Sussex Universe event before that Sussex Universe exists. So we have a whole load of pre-recorded talks on our website and via YouTube. Um, for example, here are some of them. So in, in principle, the Sussex Universe talks now stretch over all of science, although they're still very heavily leaning towards uh, physics and astronomy, but ideally there should be something of everybody there. Um, so hopefully you can see them. But like I said, today is a little bit different in that today we are uh, joining with a few of the local astronomy societies. Um, and um, yeah, so today we're gonna have a short talk from myself about some of the, the future facilities coming up. And then we're going to have um, the panel Q&A session. And then in theory, we're going to have a quiz as well, organized by one of the AstroSoc members. So at this point, I just like to um, allow my co-hosts tonight to introduce themselves, um, particularly the chairs of the astronomy Sense, uh, societies. And sorry, I don't know all of your names, so I'm going to let Doug go first, and then uh, hopefully identify the other the other chairs. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Doug Edworthy. I'm chair of the East Sussex Astronomical Society. Um, we meet in Bexhill, um, but we have uh, a dark site uh, away in the country with its uh, dome and uh, other telescopes. Uh, we're involved in uh, some outreach and we have monthly meetings that we would normally hold in Bexhill, but we're currently holding online with Zoom. Um, I'm also going to um, int uh, be, do the introduction on behalf of Seven Sisters Astronomical Society because their chair, unfortunately, can't be on Zoom tonight. Um, but he, he's asked me to let you know that Seven Sisters Astronomical Society has been going for eight years. They've got 26 members and they're primarily involved in uh, members viewing nights and in doing outreach for local events. Um, so I'm going to hand over, if I can see him, to John Fox and then to Ian Hargraves. John Fox is from Wealdon Astronomical, uh, sorry, Wealdon Astronomers and uh, Ian Hargraves is from Mid-Kent Astronomers. So, John, if you're there, over to you. We can't hear you, John, if you're speaking. No, I can see him, but I can't hear him. <laughs> Get muted. 
I don't think he is muted. No, nope. John, we can't hear you still. No, I think I think he's temporarily temporarily left. So perhaps we'll move on to Ian Hargraves of Mid Kent Astro, and uh, see if John Fox comes in afterwards. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the introductions. Um, I'm Ian Hargraves. I'm chairman of Mid Kent Astronomical Society, or MCAS as we call ourselves. Uh, we're based in the Medway Towns in North Kent. We have about 100 members. Uh, we were founded in 1976 as Mid Kent Astronomical Association. And then we changed our name in 77 to MCAS. So uh, that's how we got our name. Uh, we hold meetings twice a month. Mm. We organise outreach events, and the largest we've uh, managed so far was 4,000 people with Maidstone Borough Council over two days. Um, and we're part of the James Webb Telescope Astro Boost project. And uh, so pleased to be with you tonight. Thanks, Ian. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Astro Boost as somebody who works on web. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware of it, and I've I've helped make many of the resources for that. Um, right. Are you guys now in tier three? Is is that a worry? Are you are you already <laughs> in tier three? Or have you just entered tier three? Oh, uh, we've been in tier three. We're the highest in the country in Medway. So oh dear, oh dear. Yeah, six hundred. I hope you're stay, all staying well. In fact, one yeah. of our panel members tonight couldn't make tonight because um, she uh, contracted COVID oh, a week dear. or so ago and uh, is recovering yeah. from. Uh, from it at the moment mm. luckily she i don't think she's been hard hit but she's just very exhausted yeah 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 my sister-in-law's had it and she she's uh coming up for 60 um yeah. but she got over it and but it just left her absolutely as you say clobbered she couldn't walk yeah. more than a few steps yeah getting better now but i'm keeping um, out i'm keeping out of the way at the other end of <laughs> zoom links um, they're still still getting in i'm not sure exactly what's happening so um they, hey john yeah no we can hear you john <laughs> we can hear you john how funny okay well uh maybe we can come back to john in a second so as i said what i'm going to do is just very very briefly kind of highlight some of the facilities that we're going to see over the next um, the next decade or so. And during that time, I want you all to think of your burning questions that you can ask myself and the other members of the panel who just about cover most of the facilities I'm going to talk about. Um, so we're not using the fancy webinar feature on Zoom today. We're just using normal Zoom. So I think the easiest thing to do is for you to just um, put your questions into the chat, either directed at everybody or directed at myself. And then I'll I'll play chair later and uh, read them out to the panel and allow the panel to answer them. I think that's going to be the easiest thing. Like I said, what I've done is actually I've harvested a few slides from some of my lectures um, to tell people about some of the um, some of the future of observational astronomy. And I'll be completely honest, I wasn't actually aware of of, of the details of some of these projects before I actually wrote these lectures uh, a couple of months ago. So. Here we go. So first of all, why do astronomers build observatories? Well, one of the main things is so we can record images so they can be analyzed later. We want to see objects that are fainter than we can see with the naked eye. We want to be able to see objects in more detail than the naked eye. And we also want to see light from objects which is beyond the visible wavelengths. So see light which is not accessible to our own eyes. So for this reason, oh, we can just look at the spectrum here. Uh, just making the point here that our own eyes only see a tiny fraction of the light in the universe. So to really understand the universe, we want to observe it across the entire spectrum. So just some more introduction here. Again, these, these were harvested from some lectures, so they're a bit introductory. But when we talk about observatories, we're talking about uh, a combination of a telescope, its instrumentation, and its support structure as well. Now, before I talk about some of the upcoming facilities, I'm gonna introduce some of the current state of the art. I'm just gonna do this really, really quickly though. So this is a diagram that I made a few years ago, and this is trying to show 
some, not all, some of the most important visible and infrared observatories that we have. And the symbol here tells you roughly how big the mirrors are on that observatory. So we can see, for example, here, the, the VLT, it's composed of really four um, fairly large mirrors compared to Hubble. And we can see there are a handful of other telescopes. Now this is a graph. So on the X axis down at the bottom, we've got when this facility was first um, opened. And the Y axis, we've got kind of roughly what, what bit of the wavelength, what bit of the spectrum it looks at. So for example, Hubble and the VLT mostly focus on the, the visible. Now Hubble actually does a lot of the UV and infrared as well. And then we see things like Vista is more focused on the near infrared, Spitzer going into the mid infrared and then Herschel, um, which was very close to us for a long time here in Sussex, uh, really focused on the far infrared. And you can see that two of these facilities are no longer operating. One of these Spitzer just as of this year. And so I'm gonna use this diagram later when we introduce some of the new facilities. So you're really gonna see what's gonna change in the future. Now, obviously um, we have more than this spectrum. So you can go upwards, so you can go into the X-rays or you can go down into the, into the radio. Unfortunately, we can't put everything on the same diagram here. And that's because once we go into the radio, we're actually able to make facilities which are much, much, much larger than we can in the optical. So we can do this because it, it, technologically, it's easier to make a large radio dish than it is to make a large mirror. So you can see here, Hubble has now been relegated to almost a single pixel, a single point, compared to all of these other facilities. So things like Arecibo, which as people will have seen in the news, actually uh, quite cat catastrophically was destroyed in recent weeks. Um, and then you can see famous telescopes like the Lovell Telescope, um, the Very Large Array in the, in the US, and then this Chinese telescope, FAST, which is kind of like a, a bigger version of Arecibo. It's a single dish radio telescope. So these are all the things that we have at the moment here. And you can really see the, the kind of disconnect in, um, in area of these telescopes compared to the ones in the optical. So I'm gonna use these two pairs of, of, of images here to uh, show what we're gonna have in the future. So I think, the 2020s, probably more so than any other decade, is when we're going to get the kind of a huge collection of new facilities coming online. Um, I, I don't think, I really, um, maybe the panel members can correct me later, but I really don't think we've seen another decade when we've had so many new facilities come online. Arguably, maybe the 1990s when we had the VLT and Hubble coming online, but I don't think that really even compares to what we're going to get uh, in this decade. So jumping forwards now. So here's one which is just about online now. So this is the Simons Observatory. Um, and this is designed to actually map the cosmic microwave background. So this cosmic microwave background, which I'm sure many of you know, is light left over from the early universe. And by measuring it, it tells us about the contents and the evolution of our universe. And so the Simons Observatory here is one of the newest in a line of experiments designed to detect and measure the CMB. And you can see a picture of this telescope down here. This actually operates in the microwave regime. Um, so it's not an optical telescope, but it's more akin to a radio telescope. And actually, you can actually place this on the same kind of diagram here as the radio telescopes. And you actually see that for various reasons, it is actually quite a lot smaller than some of the ones that we have here. But nevertheless, the Simons Observatory, due mostly to its instrumentation and the specific wavelengths that it, it looks at, is going to be a revolutionary observatory as much as all the others. Going back into the more familiar territory. So I'm really kind of going forward in time here. So going forward into familiar territory, we've got um, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So this is a ground-based survey telescope. And this is gonna be really amazing because it's gonna map most of the Southern Hemisphere sky in visible light. And it's gonna do this every few nights, which means it's gonna allow us to find uh, transient phenomenon. So things that change over time. So for example, asteroids and comets, but also things like supernovae and other phenomenon as well. And this is gonna discover billions of galaxies, right? It's gonna be such a huge amount of data. We're gonna to have to build new computer systems to deal with this. As you can see from the diagram, as you can see from the photo here, this is actually almost complete. And actually first light I think is now expected 
at some point next year. So we can add on uh, the Rubin Observatory over here onto this diagram. You can see it's not quite as big as one of the individual VLTs, but it, it's very different technology because it has a very large field of view, which makes it able to map large areas of sky very efficiently. The one that you'll all know is very familiar to my heart is the Webb Telescope. So this is this upcoming space telescope. Should launch next year, but the caveat always here is that it's been subject to a number of delays and actually should have launched more than a decade ago in 2007, right? If it was really online. Now, I, I think it will launch next year. I'm fairly confident about this now. So this is a scientific successor to Hubble. It's built and operated by NASA and the European Space Agency, along with the Canadian Space Agency. Okay, I'm not gonna to talk too much about Webb, but just to point out that unlike Hubble, it operates in the infrared. So it's gonna see a, a new window on the universe. So it's not just about having a bigger telescope here. It's about being able to view the universe in a new way. So it's the contrast between the image on the left, which is um, the pillars of creation in visible light, and then the image on the right, which is the infrared. Just a nice promotional picture of Webb here. So again, we can place Webb on our own diagram here, and you can see how it compares. It's comparable in size to Rubin and the individual VLTs. So around five or six times larger than Hubble. Okay, so this is really gonna be revolutionary. Certainly when you combine the, the increase in mirror size, also with the, um, the instrumentation suite. On a similar time, kind of time scale, so maybe next year or the year afterwards, we're also gonna have the Euclid spacecraft. So this is actually a relatively small visible and infrared space telescope built by the European Space Agency. And while it is smaller than Hubble, it actually has a very large field, field of view, which will allow it to really map large areas of sky. So again, this is gonna allow us to find um, lots and lots of galaxies almost over the entire sky. So find the really bright, rare things. But you can see it really is quite small compared to Webb, but nevertheless, it's gonna have a tremendous impact. Going a bit further into the future, we've got a very similar telescope to, to Euclid, at least in terms of the science goal. And this is the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Um, like I said, this is similar, but actually has a larger mirror. There's some great history in here because most of, most of this telescope is actually a leftover spy satellite, which was donated to NASA um, by the US National Reconnaissance um, Observatory. So I can just imagine how that conversation went um, that the uh, the spy satellite people said they've got a leftover, essentially Hubble-sized telescope for people to use. And again, the science aim here is very similar to Euclid. So it's about mapping large areas of the sky, mostly in the infrared, um, but it's gonna come maybe five or six years later. And then we've got a handful of, of very dedicated missions coming this decade as well. Um, in particular, starting to look at exoplanets. So we've got one here, which is called PLATO, or the Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars. You can see this was a bit of a tortured acronym from the team there. Um, this is actually a quite funny telescope because it contains 26 small telescopes, and this is designed to find small planets around bright stars. And again, hopefully this will launch in the, the mid 2020s, and this will be really useful for finding planets like the Earth around other stars. So you can imagine that there's potentially huge scientific implications there. I think one of the, the really, really exciting ones though is the extremely large telescope. So here we have a, an artist visualization of this telescope. So this is a future ground-based telescope currently under construction by the European Southern Observatory. As I understand, it should be ready around the mid late 2020s, but one of our panel members tonight is an expert. So they can uh, certainly answer any questions we have there. It actually has a 39 meter diameter mirror so this is huge, right? Because our biggest ground-based telescopes at the moment have mirrors of around 10 meters in diameter. So this is four times larger in width, which translates to obviously around 16 times larger in area. So this telescope here is now so large that we're kind of rivaling the size of, of a small football stadium. So in particular, I think the footprint that we see here is, is very similar to the Amex football stadium in Brighton. Okay, and actually it's a little bit taller than the Amex. Um, because it's operating in the ground, it's really focused on the visible and near infrared wavelengths. 
um, and it will have exceptional resolution, but a relatively small field of view. And again, if you have any questions on the ELT, we really do have one of the experts here tonight with Apogita. And it really does ruin my diagram here. So by placing the ELT, which is this big mess of white, we've really, really messed around with the diagram. So the ELT has more or less kind of swamped this diagram, kind of rendering it useless for the future. Okay. So just some more nice promotional pictures here. I like this one because down at the bottom, you've got a picture of a uh, pickup truck to scale. Uh, so you can really see how big this facility is. Oh no. It looks like we've lost lost Will for a second there. Um, Will Will Roper? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, we appear to have lost Steve temporarily. I'm back. I'm back. Ah, Sorry, my computer oh, crashed back. then. So uh, hopefully, I didn't lose too much of me then. So just bear with me while I. Uh... No, we got up to uh, the uh, picture of VLC. I think we heard you right up until the crash, actually. Yeah, that's great. Let me uh, just jump back in. Apologies for that. Uh, can you all see my screen again now? Great. So I think I got here. So I think I was maybe talking about the truck down there at the bottom, just showing the scale of the, the ELT here. Um, this, I think, is one of the most recent pictures that I found of the actual site. So this is the actual mountain that's um, that the ELT is being constructed on. You can see, I mean, you can clearly see the structure of the uh, of the telescope emerging there with the foundations. And again, this is one of the most recent ones that I found, but this is now um, actually more than a year and a half old. Um, so I'd be actually interested to hear from Apogito about how this has changed. Um, I should also note that there are two other, what we call ELT class telescopes, which are um, being planned or under construction at the moment. And so on the left here, we have the 30 meter telescope. Um, this is smaller, obviously it's about 30 meters. It has a less good name, um, controversially, though, this has really been subject to protests about its location. So the, the aim for this telescope, uh, which has been led by mostly a consortium of, of US universities, this was initially hoped to go on Mauna Kea in the uh, Big Island of Hawaii. But there's been kind of lots of protests against further development of that mountain, which is held sacred to members of the native Hawaiian community. Um, it, it seems very unclear at the moment where this is going to end up, but it's actually, it could end up on the Canary Islands. So it might be quite funny that the, the US ELT actually ends up much closer to Europe um, than it does to the US. And obviously the European ELT is going to be in Chile in uh, South America. And then on the right hand side, we have another US telescope, I think led by again, a consortium of universities. This is the Grand Magellan Telescope. Again, this is much smaller now, so this is 25 meters. And like the European ELT, it will also be in Chile, so see in the southern sky. So again, there's loads of questions that you could potentially ask about these two, but I'll, I'll leave that for the panel. Um, another exoplanet mission here. So we have Ariel. Um, We have Ariel, which is the Atmospheric Remote Sensing Infrared Exoplanet Large Survey. Again, very tortured acronym from our friends at ESA over there, trying to uh, get something that sounds good. Um, so this is, again, a space observatory focused on exoplanets. Um, what's really special about this is that there's a huge amount of UK leadership. In fact, the overall project is led by the UK. I don't really understand the technology, but um, what I did notice about Ariel is that it actually has this elliptical mirror. There must be some good reason why it does have this elliptical mirror, but this wasn't just me making a terrible slide. It really does have this mirror. 
actually further into the future now. Um, so this is probably going to be into the 2030s. We have the next generation um, X-ray observatory, which is Athena. So this is the advanced telescope for high energy astrophysics. Um, and so this is the, the planned X-ray observatory. So this, this is still a long way away. Um, Athena really doesn't lie on this diagram, but it's useful showing the size comparison, showing that this is actually a much smaller telescope than Webb, but it will nevertheless be revolutionary in the kind of X-ray field. So we use X-rays to really probe some of the most energetic phenomena in the universe. Okay, so I've mostly talked about the, the visible um, UV and infrared. Uh, I'll now talk about what's gonna happen on the radio side. So the big thing which has come in here is the square kilometer array. So this is this really ambitious international radio observatory. I have to say lots of nice things about it because again, we have a, we have a nice senior person from the SKA consortium joining us tonight to talk about it. Uh, so again, he's gonna correct me later when I say loads of things that are wrong here. It's really, you could consider it two separate telescopes, one in South Africa and one in Australia. And together, they're actually able to probe much of the radio continuum. So the radio continuum is a very large area of, um, of wavelength space, and there's lots of different phenomena which happen there. And you can actually use different, different technologies, different techniques to probe it most efficiently. So these are all some nice visualizations that we have. So SKA here kind of mixes different radio telescope technology. So here we have all of these um, individual antennae. And then in the background, you can see lots of these kind of more traditional single uh, radio dishes. But actually linking all of these things together makes this much more than the sum of its individual parts. It becomes incredibly powerful. So SKA is designed to trace gas and star formation across most of the history of the universe. It will test gravity in extreme phenomena. It will also map the cosmological dark ages, which is actually the area of science closest to my heart, but it will also search for organic molecules and potentially emissions from extraterrestrial civilizations. It's always nice to add in aliens into any talk. Uh, again, this has huge UK leadership in that the headquarters of the SKA is actually based just outside Manchester at the Jodwell Bank Observatory. So uh, I believe this is the SKA headquarters, the building in the foreground, and you can see the very famous level telescope in the background. Um, in better times, this is a great place to go visit. Uh, so not the SK headquarters themselves, but the Jubble Bank Observatory, which has a large visitor center, allowing you to get very close to many of these very large telescopes. And um, because they keep inviting me, do go to the Blue Dot Music Festival, which combines a kind of a, a great music festival with uh, lots of great science as well, a fantastic site. This is a really special place to camp and listen to some bands for a weekend as a as many of my students and postdocs will attest to. And again, we can place SKA on our diagram here. So we've had to revert to our, uh, our expanded diagram and just really showing that um, when you put all of these telescopes together, SKA mid and SKA low, which are all made up of lots of smaller individual elements, they really do produce this huge area, okay? Producing what will be one of the most powerful observatories that we've we've ever built. But it's just amazing to see the difference in scale of the size of these observatories compared to say Webb over here, which is relatively small, okay? But still extremely powerful in its own way. So this is just showing what a difference going to different wavelengths makes. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is move on to the panel session. I'm gonna apologize straight away because and this is really for Doug, because uh, I know he'd put lots of questions in the chat. When I crashed, I lost all of my previous chat. Uh, it might be that so that is saved somewhere. Maybe other people still have it. Um, but um, Doug, please do put your questions in again is what I'm trying to say. So what I'm gonna do now is introduce um, the panel or allow them to introduce themselves. I realized that I didn't right at the very beginning introduce myself properly. And that's just because I know many of you have seen me talk before, but my name is Dr. Stephen Wilkins. I'm now head of astronomy at the University of Sussex. Uh, my particular interests as you've probably gathered are on the distant universe and in particular the Webb telescope. 
And now I'm going to ask uh, the panel members to maybe turn on their video and say hello. I'm going to try and do this in alphabetical order. Um, so I guess that's you first, Phil, if you're around. Hello, can you see me okay? I can. Good to and see you, Phil. Can hear me. Pretty good. We can. Um, yeah, I'm Dr. Phil Ball. I'm at Queen Mary University of London, or, well, I'm at home right now, uh, like everyone else. And um, so my specialism is in cosmology, and I work on a couple of different uh, big future telescopes. So uh, the main ones are uh, the Square Kilometre Array, where I work on some of the cosmology side of things, and uh, also the Vera Rubin Observatory, which was that, that big um, optical uh, visible light telescope uh, on top of a mountain in Chile. Thanks, Phil. And because uh, one of our other panel members was missing tonight, I think Apogita, you're next. Hopefully you can see me. I can't see myself. Uh, we can see you and we can hear you. <laughs> okay. Good to um, see you. So, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I'm Apogita Verma. I'm a senior researcher at the University of Oxford and I um, am currently project scientist for the UK ELT program. Um, so I'm involved kind of with the instrument teams that are, are building the instruments for the ELT um, in the UK. Um, I also work a bit with ESO and I'm also involved with the Vera C. Rubin Observatory that Phil and Steve both mentioned, um, where I've been co-chair of the Strong Lensing Science Collaboration for the last four years. Thanks, Apogita. I should say that I know both Apogita and Phil from a uh, my previous life in Oxford, where I worked as a researcher, um, and Jeff, who I uh, don't know, actually. Hi, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, can I just say, Steve, uh, that you had a, a very good description of the SK, so that was spot on. Thank you. Um, so my name is Jeff Wegg. I work at the Square Kilometre Array organization uh, based here in the UK. Uh, I'm one of the project scientists. Uh, prior to this, uh, I was based in Chile and fortunate uh, to work on ALMA, which is another big telescope uh, that many of you will be familiar with. And so I'm here, uh, happy to answer any questions uh, about the SKA tonight. Great, thanks, Jeff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna start off with a question that I'm gonna ask to every single panel member of my own desire. And then I'll, I'll go through and I'll try, I see I've already got far too many questions already. So thanks everybody for all of those. Um, and then I'll try and kind of identify individual panel members to ask some of the questions. Just to apologize here that I think it's unlikely we'll make it through all of the questions tonight, um, but I'm sure most people will be happy to try and answer them in email, or certainly I would be as well. So I'm gonna ask this question to all of the panel members. Apart from the projects that you work on, which of the upcoming facilities are you most looking forward to? And because my name begins with W, I'm going to take it in reverse alphabetical order. So I'm going to start off with myself. And I'm going to say, I haven't actually thought about my own answers to this question, as you can maybe tell, which one am I most looking forward to? So I, I don't work on ELT at all, um, but I think that one is, um, just for the scale of it, is going to be really, really exciting. So you will certainly be able to use the ELT for my science, but I have no connection uh, I've never worked on it, um, and I, but I think just that the scale of building something that large on the top of a mountain in the desert in Chile, um, it's just going to be something that we'll be able to talk to the public a lot about in a much easier way than some of the other telescopes. Um, just the amount of technology which is going into it and the development, so ELT and maybe Apogee can can um, tell me off here, but it's probably been under development for at least 15, 20 years. What I would say is when it comes to the ELT, there's one thing that has always disappointed me. And I think at an early point in its life, it was designed to have a mirror, which was 42 meters in diameter, but unfortunately that was de-scoped. Now as a massive Douglas Adams fan, actually making that mirror 42 meters in diameter would have made me so happy. And I think unfortunately, even when they've gone down to 39 meters, it's not quite 42 yards unfortunately. Um, so again, they really messed up there. So maybe Apogee, you could tell them off in the future. But how about you, Jeff? Other than the SKA, um, what are you most looking forward to? Well, I think you were right early on. We are in a, uh, coming into a decade when there are so many great facilities that are coming online. In addition uh, to the ones we already have, you've mentioned ELT. Potentially early in the next decade, we'll have Athena. 
Uh, we've got a number of ground-based survey instruments. And I think one of the really exciting things right now is that we're really drowning in data. I mean, it, uh, <laughs> to, the, um, to the dismay of many of our PhD students, you know, we've got these big survey instruments, soon the LSST, soon the SKA, Euclid, that are mapping out, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of square degrees of the sky. And so I think all of the fact that all of these instruments are now working together, will be working together uh, to tell us so much about the universe around us, I think is, is, is fantastic. And it, you know, especially for the students and postdocs coming in, it's just really an exciting time uh, to be working in the field. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I mean, I, I'm hoping that somebody might pick this up in a question later as well, but one of the, the great challenges of all these new facilities is the vast amount of data that we're going to collect. And I know a big challenge for SKA is actually the computational power that we're going to need to actually analyze some of these observ observations in the right way. But maybe we can expand upon that if we get some questions. How about you, Apogito? What, what are you looking forward to beyond the ELT and, and Rubin? Well, everything. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll try and answer your question rather than just say something random. But I mean, it is a really exciting time. and. Uh, I think the way you started your talk was, was spot on. Um, I, I'm not going to be biased, but I am really excited about SK. I mean, it's just, this, again, kind of what you said about ELT. For me, it's, it's the scale of it. Um, and it's kind of, it's so flexible in terms of what it can achieve and what it can observe and how sensitive it's going to be. And similarly for Athena, we're not going to have anything well we haven't had anything comparable in the x-ray for so long um and it's really going to revolutionize our understanding of like the high energetic universe so they're my top two picks thanks Apogita. and how about you phil um so honestly i'm a bit of a gravity buff and so i'm really looking forward to lisa which is a, a space interferometer that that's going to measure gravitational waves and and you know not just uh the boring gravitational waves that, that we can already detect on Earth. This, this is something that's going to be able to even um, see some of the gravitational waves that um, were left over from essentially right after the Big Bang, um, you know, what we call the gravitational wave background. So, you know, it's, it's this tremendous thing. It's made of three different tiny spacecraft and they've got like some, some kind of big, well, well quite, quite massive mass in them and a bunch of mirrors and some complicated laser stuff that I, I, I goes over my head a bit and they got to bounce the lasers off the mirrors and, and you know measure these tiny 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 ripples in in space time itself so I, I, I can't think of many things cooler than that. Thanks Phil and thanks for uh, prompting me that I actually forgot to talk about any of the gravitational wave observatories in my talk and that's obviously one of the the huge changes in the last um, last five years, really, actually discovering gravitational waves for the first time, um, confirming Einstein's general relativity or providing new confirmation of Einstein's general relativity, but also providing a new view on our universe. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into some of the questions from people now, both from YouTube and from the chat. Um, the first one is gonna be aimed at Jeff, which is um, in the diagram that, Steve showed um, those two values for SKA don't add up to one kilometer squared. Why is it called the square kilometer array? Oh, so we're starting with a trick question. I think that's an excellent question. In fact, um, this was a subject uh, of discussion for one of the meetings we had in the office earlier this week. So to give you some history, the origin of the square kilometer array uh, began uh, back in the early 90s. Uh, effectively, it was based on the calculation of how much collecting area one would need to detect atomic hydrogen, so the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen, uh, emission from this line in normal, say, M star type galaxies at significant cosmological distances. Now, the calculation that's, that was done suggested that what we would need would be a square kilometer of collecting area. So that, in the early 90s, um, set off a, a large, uh, I think, push from around the world to develop uh, a technology, a radio wavelength technology that could be built out and deployed uh, to lead to the sensitivity we would require uh, to achieve this science goal over roughly a square kilometer of collecting area. And so this has led to some of the pathfinders and precursors, you know, like ASCAP in Western Australia, um, Meerkat, which has been doing some great science uh, in the career of South Africa and other big telescopes like FAST, which you mentioned uh, earlier on. So, um, 
early on in the design of the current phase uh, of the project, it was recognized that it would be too expensive to build a full square kilometer of collecting area. And so through a, a pair of rescopes, uh, we arrived at the design that you showed uh, early on today in terms of the collecting area. So it's a small fraction of a full square kilometer of collecting area. And so the idea would be that later on in the future, uh, once we demonstrate uh, the capabilities and the technology, we could uh, hope to expand that out uh, to a much larger scale. But initially, we will still be doing some great science uh, with the facilities that won't uh, add up to a full square kilometer of collecting area. So it's really, uh, at this point, it's really an ambition to get up to that high. Over the long term, but I mean, as I said, I think these telescopes that we're building right now are already going to be able to do transformational science uh, in many different areas by covering that frequency range of 50 uh, megahertz up to roughly 15 gigahertz uh, in the first instance. But we would ultimately like to build out uh, beyond that. But again, uh, in this first stage, we will be able to do some great science with what we have uh, initially. So a kind of follow-on question, um, we, we've seen that many telescopes get renamed at some point in their, in their life cycles. So for example, the LSST telescope was recently, oh, I think a few months ago, renamed the, the Vera Rubin uh, Observatory. Um, do you think something like that could happen with SKA? Could it be named after somebody or something? Uh, that's a very good question. So that hasn't been discussed uh, yet. So currently, um... Uh, just to give you some more background on the structure of the organization, we are now, in fact, within the next month, uh, evolving into what's called an intergovernmental organization governed by treaty. So this is the agreement that all of the host country, or all the countries uh, will abide by uh, in operating, building and operating uh, the telescopes. And so within these now legally binding treaty documents, uh, we are referred to as the Square Kilometre Array uh, Observatory or the SKAO. Uh, and so therefore, name, renaming the telescopes at this stage uh, would be both... Um, uh, would be difficult, uh, in fact, legally, as well as, uh, of course, all of the, all of the, um, uh, the branding material that would need to be changed. <laughs> but it's not impossible that it could, uh, won't happen in the future. It's a good question. Well, if you need a name, the Wilkins Observatory sounds great. All right. <laughs> okay, I think the next question is for Phil. Um, so which of the future telescope projects will give us the best new measurements of the expansion of the universe? Um, that's a really good question. So there's there's actually lots of different ways of measuring how fast the universe expands. And at the moment, they don't all agree with one another. So we think something fishy could be going on, either to do with our interpretation of the data. It might be that, you know, we've forgotten to or haven't realized we need to make certain corrections that, um, you know, that... It, it, that are in the data, but um, you know, aren't, aren't immediately obvious to us. Like, like you were saying earlier, it's it's getting more and more complicated to analyze all this modern data from these fancy new telescopes. Um, but probably in terms of the kind of raw, you know, fundamental ability to try and measure the expansion rate, there's a, a telescope called DESI or or, or, a, or a survey called DESI. I think it stands for the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which is, is, is very recently started observing. Um, and what that is, is um, it's, it's a normal um, visible light telescope with a big mirror uh, and it's based on earth. But what, what, that's, what, what the special thing that it has is um, it has all these tiny robot arms inside the telescope that can position uh, optical fibers that then go into uh, uh, something we call a spectrograph, which is like a you know a fancy way of um, measuring the spectrum of light, like like what you'd see with a prism. And it has you know hundreds, maybe thousands of these little robot arms just whirring away all the time, and it, it, it can it can measure uh, very accurately the the distance uh, to uh, tens of thousands of galaxies per day. And so right now that's that's you know observing and. And, and uh, probably that's going to be able to measure things like the expansion rate of the universe um, quite far back into the universe's history um, to, you know, better than 1% or something like that. But something really important is you, you don't just want to measure the rate that the, the, the space is expanding at, at, at one particular time in the universe's history. What really matters is uh, measuring it at, at a whole bunch of times and kind of tracking how it changes. And the reason for that is we, we know that the expansion of the universe is accelerating due to some uh, weird stuff we, we call dark energy. 
out of ignorance. Um, and we'd love to know what dark energy is. So uh, the more measurements we can get over more different times, um, that, that, that's what's uh, really going to let us figure out what dark energy is, I think. So DESI is probably the most accurate, but it's you know going to be part of a, a kind of patchwork of different experiments that can give us measurements of a whole range of different ages of the universe. Thanks, Phil. That's great. And uh, thanks for making me look bad by uh, not mentioning Desi in the first place. In my defence, though, it already has had first light. And I think just picking up a point from Phil there, all of these projects kind of individually will, will help us, but it's really the synergy of all of them together, putting all of these things together, different ways of looking at the universe, which will really help us kind of uncover this big mystery, this dark energy and, and even dark matter, which is still unclear what it really is. Um, so thanks for that. My next question is for Aprajita. And Samuel asks, does the use of many separate mirrors on large telescopes such as the ELT mean that the image can be made sharper compared to a single mirror? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and actually, the reason why there's lots of individual mirrors is because that's the only way to fill these large apertures. So basically we're currently at the limit of what we can cast as a mirror, um, which is about eight meters across. So that's why the VLTs um, and Gemini and have kind of, you know, they're, they're the state of the art because we simply haven't been able to build bigger than that. So the reason why the ELT, JWST, the Keck telescopes, they all have, and the Grand Kang telescope in the Canaries all have these segmented mirrors. And it's not that it gives you better image quality on their own, but it's a practical way of building up that mirrored surface. So you're right that the larger the mirror, um, the better or the more detail we can resolve. So that's really the motivation to go to bigger and bigger mirrors. Um, but it's not necessarily those individual tiles that, that make it better. It's actually the combination of the bigger mirror but also using novel technologies, particularly in the optical and infrared, um, such as adaptive optics, which basically is a system that will correct for the uh, disturbances caused by the atmosphere. So why stars twinkle um, without removing that effect, you don't actually get the gain in resolution or, or spatial detail um, that you get from these large mirrors. So it's actually quite a complex problem because um, actually we say for the ELT, there's 798 individual 1.4 meter hexagons that make up that surface. And each of those has motors behind them. Um, and also what we call edge sensors, which kind of allow each segment to know where the next segment is so that you're constantly preserving um, the parabolic surface of the mirror. So it's actually a really hard problem, um, but they have fit, you know, solved that in both uh, the Keck telescopes and the Grand Can, and they're basically scaling that up for the ELT. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Abhijitu. And I was just gonna quickly share this figure again as well. I'd like to note here that I've got exactly the right number of hexagons in this, uh, in this image. So this is exactly accurate. Well done, Steve. <laughs> so let me just bring up the questions again, because by doing this, I've moved my chat away. OK, I'm going to solicit responses for everybody to answer this question. And this question is, um, I'm going to rephrase it slightly. What is the impact on the forthcoming mega constellations, things like Starlink, going to be on the future of ground-based um, astronomy? So does anybody want to jump in and, and say something about this? I can say this is, I mean, for the SK, this has been um, uh, an area that we've been uh, looking at very closely uh, over the last couple of years. And in fact, um, uh, members from our organization have been dis in discussion uh, with uh, Elon Musk's team, uh, discussing the potential impact of some of these constellations on radio astronomy in particular. Um, we, are, we have been concerned about the impact uh, on our observations of around 15 gigahertz, but I can say we've had a very constructive uh, discussion uh, with these groups uh, and there will be attempts to mitigate the impact uh, of these constellations on our observations. Does anybody else want to add anything? 
I, I think this similar discussions, I, I'm not privy to them, but similar discussions have been happening with LSS, oh, sorry, I should call it Rubin and um, those uh, satellite teams. And, you know, I think at least there are communication channels open to try to mitigate the effects. Um, I think from ESO's perspective, um, I believe that the actual problem will not be as large as say for the or the large area survey telescopes um, such as Rubin. So um, I think as long as the astronomical community is talking with these teams, I hope we can reach uh, solutions that don't block out our night sky because there's so much for us to learn from it. Yeah, it would obviously be a real shame if we if we lost if we lost access to our deepest night sky, unless of course um, these companies lead them with lots of extra money, would be willing to build radio telescopes on the far side of the moon or new space telescopes. That might just uh, make us. But then again, having so many mega constellations will also obviously affect naked eye astronomy because seeing lots of things whizzing around the sky. Um, Although it's nice to occasionally see satellites moving across the sky, and particularly the International Space Station, if there was thousands of them, that is really, I think, going to affect people's enjoyment of the night sky. If we really did get to a point where you had so many that it became difficult to focus on, on kind of just looking with your own eyes at individual stars, um, that would be a great shame and a great loss for us. Can, uh, can okay. I point out, um, you know, it's not just a problem for ground-based astronomers either. So... Uh, a lot of these constellations are being put in quite low orbits, but th there's there's plenty of commercial satellites also being put into higher orbits. And even Hubble, you don't have to look through Hubble data for too long to see satellite trails, e even in, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope images. So it, it, it's already already now today quite quite a pain to deal with all of this stuff. And then once. Uh, once orbit's completely full of these things, I, I think this week the European Union announced a, it, its intention to build its own constellation as well, another one. Um, you know, it, it's even even with a lot of um, mitigation procedures, it's going to make things difficult for anyone who has anything to do with space. I think. So is that the is that the third, or is there even more constellations now planned? Obviously, there's Starlink, and then there's the one that the UK just rescued out of bankruptcy, uh, OneWeb. And now, yeah, there's this idea of a European Union one. Um, or uh, you know, Amazon related one or, or something. I think it's four now, but um, yeah. you know, it's too many already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you can imagine um, um, rapidly developing countries like China and India will at some point want to have their own constellations as well. Um, so it, it is certainly a worry, and I think it's not just for professional astronomers, but also just everybody's enjoyment of the night sky will be affected by these large constellations. That being said, I am still in awe of actually seeing one of the trails of uh, the Starlink satellites, watching about 20 points of light move across the sky in a nice orderly line was pretty amazing. But obviously, once the constellation is assembled, it won't look quite as cool as that, that initial launch. Okay. Uh, a question for Aprajita here, which is about an update on the ELT. What is the projected first light date? Um, so I should say 2025. Um, <laughs> so currently- Should Apple, I not laugh there? No, no, you, I think you can believe it, kind of. I think what you had kind of um, mid, mid to late 2020s, I shouldn't say that actually, let's just stick with 2025, but- um, <laughs> Currently, because of the COVID pandemic, work has uh, been postponed on the mountain. So uh, the picture you showed, things have kind of evolved a little bit since then. But basically, currently, there's there's no work on the mountain. So that date that I mentioned doesn't include any COVID-related delays. Although it's worthwhile saying that a lot of progress has been made kind of off the telescope. So with the instrument teams, but also in things that don't actually involve the construction. Um, so it's not that everything is shut down just because work on the mountain is, is currently not in progress. So Thanks, I think a better date than that, I'm afraid. Well, 
I mean, I, I expected that kind of answer given the uh, the experience with Web, where we thought it was going to launch in 2018, and that was that was as late as early 2017, uh, and obviously it was delayed by an extra few years. So, I I, I hope that something like the ALT is going to be a little bit more predictable than than um, some of the space missions, just because I think there's less risks overall. Would you yeah. agree with that? I, yeah. I do, and um, yeah, it's a lot cheaper, shall we say? Yeah. Yeah, and if you shake it, parts aren't going to fall off it, like <laughs> happened with Web when that was that was shaken. Uh, just to remind people to um, probably easiest to send questions direct to me or to everyone just in the chat. Um, I've got one here which I can't answer, and I'm not sure if anybody else is going to be able to answer, but I'll give it a go. Does anybody know why Ariel has an elliptical mirror? Everyone's thinking. Everyone's thinking. I have a wild guess. Go on, then. If it's something, if if it can do things like directly imaging exoplanets, if you have a telescope that's too symmetric, then any of the support structures inside the telescope are going to give you like uh, diffraction patterns when you're you're doing this kind of imaging. So it's quite common with radio telescopes actually uh, to build them. Um, we, we call it off-axis. So where the receiver isn't in the middle, like pointing at the middle of the dish, it's pointing off center to kind of spoil the symmetry of, the, of that diffraction pattern. So I wonder if it's something to do with that, but that's a, you know, a real stab in the dark. Yeah. Again, I don't know enough details about Ariel. I, I, yeah. I mean, if, if it, if it is direct imaging, that would make sense that it was something like that because you'd have then a, yeah, the asymmetric point spread function so it might make it easy to actually find things certainly if you observe the same star at different angles maybe there's something that you can do there but unfortunately i don't think we have a a, a decisive question uh i had hopes that one of uh, the panelists tonight was going to be somebody who actually works on aerial but unfortunately they couldn't make it okay and we do have actually an elliptical mirror in the mm -hmm. in the ELT design. So M5, the fifth mirror that sends um, the light out to the instruments is elliptical because the beam at that point is elliptical. Um, okay. I don't know also about aerial, but it may have something to do with that too. So it seems like a few people are not content with all of these telescopes that we've been talking about. Uh, so far tonight, and they're asking about even further into the future. So um, there was one question about future space missions, which I'll try and answer. But before that, there's been a couple of questions about do people see optical telescopes on the moon or radio telescopes on the far side of the moon? Does anybody want to chime in here? Yeah, actually, um, uh, this is an interesting topic that we've been uh, discussing recently because um so ESA had put out a call, so the European Space Agency had, had put out a call for effectively ideas for potential science projects that could be attached to their scientific payloads, which are planned to go back to the moon uh, toward the end of this decade. And many ideas were put, in fact, I think they were on the order of a thousand ideas put forward. Um, many of those fell into the category of low frequency radio astronomy. And there are a couple of good reasons for this. Um, the first off, as most of you will be aware, um, much of the interference that we have to deal with at low frequencies, specifically below 100 megahertz, uh, is human made. Uh, so if you can go to the moon, specifically the dark side of the moon, uh, then that's great. You get blocked um, by the moon uh, from that interference. But also generally radio astronomy dipoles, for example, are, are very uh, low maintenance in the sense you can lay them out there. They don't have any moving parts. And so they're, you know, you wouldn't need a big uh, group of people to, to run an observatory at low frequencies on the moon. So uh, we had a workshop uh, two or three weeks ago now uh, with ESA to discuss uh, some of these ideas in more detail. And again, it emerged that low frequencies might be um, a high priority for ESA, at least. Uh, it's certainly the case on the, on the American side uh, that a number of low frequency radio telescope ideas have been put forward and are seriously being discussed. In fact, I think lunar astronomy over the next decade uh, might... Um, Go through a bit of a renaissance uh, period uh, such as that was which was experienced um, you know many decades ago so i think it's a really exciting time now uh, for these sort of uh, these sort of projects from the moon so do you think in a sense that doing something like this may kind of allow government to almost subsidize exploitation of the moon so 
by saying, actually, we're going to build a radio telescope on the moon. That's going to allow, it's going to provide some motivation to actually build some of the infrastructure to do that in the future. And then maybe that will be some kind of commercial exploitation in the future off the back of that. Do you reckon are there those considerations here or is it just purely going to be scientific and never? That's a good question. I think so. If you look at, for example, uh, the U.S. Artemis project, it has the goal of returning um, humans, in fact, the first woman on the moon uh, within the next decade, um, uh, but for scientific exploration. So I have, I'm not familiar with any of the industrial applications for this, but, you know, certainly one of the nice, I think one of the really exciting things we've seen uh, within the space community over the last you know, decade or so has been the involvement of industry, uh, you know, companies like SpaceX, uh, that you know, in some you know, in some respects, can do these kind of projects uh, more cheaply than we can uh, through governments. And so, I think it could be that there are some uh, industrial applications uh, to some of the work that um, uh, that is ongoing. Cool. Okay, uh, our producer, how about again? I'm gonna, there was a few different questions on this. So, is there anything to stop us making a larger ground-based optical telescope? And are there any prospects of having a optical telescope on the moon? Um, so I think I'll just go back to something you said earlier, Steve, about the ERT being de-scoped from 42 meters. It actually started off as the overwhelmingly large telescope, which had a hundred meter diameter mirror. Um, and the reason why it kind of came down to the 39, well, first 42 and then 39 is because that's kind of what you can securely build with the least amount of risk. Um, now that obviously doesn't stop any astronomer from dreaming bigger. Um, so yes, there are groups starting up to kind of reinvigorate the idea of larger telescope diameters um, pushing towards hundred meters and also indeed on the moon. Um, but I think at this point, we actually need to demonstrate that the ELT works or the ELTs um, and it's only actually at that point will people look beyond that. I mean, it's already a huge undertaking. Um, so as ever, people are planning these things about 50 years ahead, um, but I hope that um, we will be seeing things in the decades to come. Yeah, I was always intrigued by the, uh, the overwhelmingly large telescope proposal because we were almost planning on going from something 10 meters in diameter to something 100 meters in diameter. So a factor of a hundred times bigger um, it did seem like a bit of a leap. To be honest, I even think going from uh, eight or 10 meters to 40 meters seems like a huge leap. But yeah, if that's if that's the direction that we need to go. And I know somebody mentioned the future of, um, of space observatories as well. So space observatories take decades longer than, than uh, the ground-based observatories just because of the complexity. So for example, Hubble was... Um, around 25 years in development. Webb has been um, probably more than 30 years in development at this point. So at the moment, we're already thinking about the, the next generation, what's going to come after Webb. And the idea that scientists are coalescing around is called Louvoir, which is the large ultraviolet optical infrared surveyor. So this is a telescope. Um, I think it, it, it looks very similar to the design of Webb, so it folds up, so it can actually fit on a launcher but he's looking at something 12 or 16 meters in diameter. So again, kind of talking about factors of, of five to 10 times larger than Webb. So a kind of similar type of jump. Um, science, science goals for that telescope, I believe are more focused on uh, exoplanets, which is one of the, these areas of science, which has really transformed in the last 10, 15 years with the discovery of, uh, of thousands of planets now around other stars. Okay. So I think I'm going to do another five or 10 minutes of questions, if that's all right with people. And then we will hand over to, I think, Will Joyce and some of the Astro Socks for the next part. So I'm just looking through my questions to try and find something unique. So just bear with me. Uh, lost my list of questions now. So this is a bit of more of a science focused question, but when measuring distances to quasars and I guess distant galaxies, how does um, gravitational redshifting impact that measurement? 
Um, I don't know if anybody wants to have a stab at this. So obviously there, there are different effects of redshift here. So I'm going to pick on Phil because this is a cosmologist delight to talk about all the different types of redshift that there are. Um, so there might not be thinking specifically about gravitational redshift like we want to think about it, but I'll let you have a stab at that, Phil. Yeah, so, so in reality, there are, there are lots of ways that gravity affects light that you might describe as a redshift. So, um, you know, in fact, you can write down equations for them all and, and measure the, the different sizes. Um, so kind of um, the big one is the expansion of, the, of space itself. That's by far the biggest. That's that's the thing that that you know stretches light the most, and and that's the thing that we we always account for when we're measuring distances. And in fact, whenever we're trying to measure distances to something like, I think the example is a distant quasar. It's it's like ninety nine point nine percent all about the just the expansion of space, and you know that's kind of one of the things we're interested in studying with quasars as well. But there's a bunch of other effects on top of that as well. And, and depending on what you're looking at and how you look at it, that could have an effect too. There's, there's a, a kind of straightforward one, which is um, what we call a Doppler shift. And it's just because the quasar is, is moving um, relative to us as well as, you know, on top of the expansion of space. So, um, you know, like, like an ambulance going past and, and the, the frequency of its siren changes, it, it, it's, it's another similar effect. Um, but there's a bunch of other ones as well, and they, they all have complicated names, and they're, they're mostly named after, um, you know, relativity um, researchers from the 60s. So there's that something called the sachs wolf effect, which is, you know, if if uh, if you're a, if you're emitting light from inside a quasar, for example, uh, that normally means you're, you're in a relatively dense uh, region of space where there's more gravity than average. And so as, as the light, as the photons try and um, get away from the quasar, which they can do easily, um, that, that gravity kind of tries to pull them back a little bit and causes an additional um, stretching of the light, so an additional redshift. It's a tiny effect, but we can measure it. There's another one called the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, which is like kind of more, more of the same, but due to all of the galaxies um, between, between us and the quasar. And then there's a bunch of other things like uh, gravitational lensing um, and... The Rees Sharma effect. Uh, if 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 you want to look that one up, uh, you know I could go on for hours about different ways of of redshifting light. But the main one is definitely the expansion of space itself, and that's that's all we always take into account. And it's by far the largest. The others are just small corrections. I look forward to hearing about the bull effect in the future, uh, just because it sounds funny. It's so I think be terrible though. So. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be it'd be something that Rex doing uh Rex something cosmology. Right? Want, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'd be something that everybody hates and be like, oh god, that bull effect is stopping us. So it'll be like the the cosmologist version of dust or something. They they can curse well, mine. <laughs> so I'm actually gonna end on um a question which I wish I'd planted because it's so good. Uh and so everybody can uh, answer this one, but it wasn't a plan. Uh, and this question is, will there be data from future uh, telescopes available for the public? Are there any projects like citizen science projects, uh, I guess things like Zooniverse, planned to get the public involved? And I think, can everybody have a go at answering that? Um, I can start. So I think the resounding answer is, is yes. I think we're already at the stage where there's so much data. There's plenty for everyone to get involved with both just not just looking at the beautiful images, but actually doing science with them. So I actually um, run a citizen science project to look at gravitational lenses uh, in sensitive surveys and, and the surveys, for example, that both Rubin and Euclid and other current telescopes are doing are perfect for finding these really rare events. And there'll be plenty of things um, like Galaxy Zoo. I believe there's also Jeff might know a radio zoo um, and loads of things where people power and people science is really welcome. So I think, yes. And certainly it's, it's certainly part of the kind of integrated view of what Rubin data uh, will be and how it'll be distributed. So the universe is, is integrated as a citizen science platform for Rubin. 
And so the only thing I would add to that, I think Aprajita gave a, a fantastic answer to that question. The only thing I would add from the radio point of view would be uh, SETI and, and projects like SETI at home. Uh, you know, we know that SETI can piggyback on a lot of other experiments as they're ongoing. And the problem is, of course, the volume of data that's generated is too much for most astronomers uh, or their PhD students or postdocs to look at. So, you know, projects like SETI at home will have a place, I think, um, in the SKA era. Yeah, I was going to say on that note, just before Phil jumps in, um, one of the most famous citizen science projects, Galaxy Zoo, I think was a, maybe this is apocryphal, but was born out of a particular PhD student getting annoyed at having to classify galaxies themselves and then thinking, actually, maybe we could get the public to do this for us and uh, save them time. Phil? Yeah, so, so um, I, I, I totally agree with everyone else that there's, there's going to be, in fact, even more, you know, a, a, just a, a massive variety of particularly weird objects that we're going to see. When, once you start with something like the Vera Rubin Observatory, that's taking pictures of the entire sky every three or half of the entire sky every three days, um, or something as sensitive as the SK, we're going to start seeing really weird stuff that we had no idea we'd ever see. So we haven't developed our normal data analysis computer programs to detect those things. So, so we're going to need, you know, human brains and human eyes to help us with that. Now, now the computers are going to give us a run for our money. There are lots of uh, kind of interesting new techniques that we'd, we'd put in the, the, the category of artificial intelligence. You know, computers are getting quite good at driving cars now, and they, they don't often run people over. Um, so, you know, um, we, we, we can kind of trust them with astronomical data a little bit as well. But um, ev even then, the, the, there's, there's nothing quite like eyeballing something and, and, you know, scratching your head and saying, hmm, that's weird. Uh, there have been a lot of Nobel Prizes won that way. So I think uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. Thanks, Phil. Some good quotes there for the future. I'm glad we've been recording this. Uh, yeah, just to add to that, I think it's exactly right. All of these big projects are going to have uh, citizen science projects attached to them. Um, many of the telescopes, oh, in fact, all of them over a long enough time scale, the, the data will be public as well. Now, for things like SKA and uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory, which are going to collect huge amounts of data over large areas of the sky, I think it's unlikely that people are going to be able to download much of that data onto their own computer and have a look around. But with things like web, um, that certainly will be possible. So a lot of data on web will be immediately publicly available, not just to scientists, but anybody. So you can actually go ahead and just download it onto your computer and you can play around with it yourself. Um, one of the simplest things that you can do is make your own um, color versions of these images. So by combining different images together, you can make your own color images. So this is something that you can routinely do with Hubble at the moment. So I mentioned this because I wrote a tutorial for some of our undergraduate students where I basically tell them to go choose any images from the Hubble archive. And then I've given them a, a kind of instruction guide to how they can combine those images and um, combine them in different ways to make their own nice color images. And what's nice about this is that if they've chosen the numbers almost randomly how to combine these things together, every single image that they create is gonna be unique to them. And so that they've created from that project essentially their own unique picture of the universe by combining the Hubble data in different ways. And so we will be able to do that with web. Now, the vast majority of data on web, I don't think uh, 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 people are gonna wanna download, but I'm sure lots of it, particularly of, of very famous nearby galaxies, they will. Um, so I think at that point, I'm just gonna ask everybody to thank the panel again. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking 45 minutes, an hour out of your, your evenings to come and talk to everybody. Um, it's been great. Sorry we didn't manage to get around all the questions. This is always the way. We have recorded this. I know I didn't actually, oh, yeah, no, we're live on YouTube. So this is live on YouTube. So I'll, I'll check everybody's fine with this, but hopefully we'll put a recording of this online as well at some point in the future so people can look back at it. And again, I'm very, very happy for people to contact me and ask me questions in the future. I'm very accessible to it. So I'd just like to thank everybody for all the panel members again. I'm sure you can see in the chat, you can see lots of people saying thank you as well. And so at this point, I'm going to pass back to Doug, I think, uh, and ask him to introduce the next part of tonight's event. 
Okay. Is that all right, Doug? And I will, um, I'm going to wave goodbye from me. So I'm going to close thank my you. video off so you can see Doug and Will. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Stephen. That's, that's absolutely, that was a, a very, very interesting uh, Q&A session. Um, thank you all, all, to all the panel members uh, for giving up your time. As Stephen said, we, we really appreciate it. Uh, but now we're coming on to the uh, to the fun section, uh, to the light, the more light-hearted uh, part of the of the evening. Um, I'm reliably informed by our member Will Joyce uh, that he's put together um, a quiz that's going to entertain us, educate us, and amuse us. Uh, not necessarily in in that order. Um, so what I'm going to do is hand over to Will, and I'm assured. Uh, by Stephen, and I think probably William Roper can confirm this, that Will's going to be given the, uh, the, the, the the steering wheel from now on, so he can, uh, if necessary, share screen and uh, take over the uh, the meeting. Uh, is that okay, William? William Roper? I'm, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to do uh, it. Oh. oh, no, sorry, Stephen, what you saying? I'm just going to apologise for telling my son off as well. I didn't realise I had the microphone still on, so apologies if you all heard that. That's fine, Stephen. You need to go off and get something to eat. Don't worry, I'm listening along while I eat my dinner. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, we'll open. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can do whatever you need. Okay, well, if uh, William Joyce can um, take control of it. William, your microphone looks to be open, so I'll leave, it, leave, leave it to you. Yes. I, I'm happy to just, um, just read. I don't think I will need to share the screen okay. unless it unless it transpires that way. So, can everyone see and hear me? Well, got some thumbs up there. Good evening, everyone. And I'm sure you'll um, agree that that was a fascinating series of questions and answers from, from the panel of astronomers. I, I certainly enjoyed it. I hope you all did too. Um, it's our last meeting of the year, and it's kind of near Christmas. I got asked to put together a few questions, so I've gone and done that. There's some easy ones. There's some very easy ones. There's some which you can't possibly get wrong. And well, there's about 20 altogether in different categories. And it's also possible to earn a few bonus points and I'll mention where they are. So if you want to um, do your own tallies as these questions go on, you're welcome to do so. And without further ado, if everyone's ready, I can get, hit you with the first question. Everyone ready? Thumbs up? Or, yeah. Okay. Astro Quiz 2020, rapidly put together by Will Joyce. Question one. Which two planets are making a great conjunction in our skies later this month? Start with the hard one. That's what I say. 